Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. And this is Words and Numbers. An international team of researchers from the universities of Tübingen, Barcelona, and Warsaw have recently published some interesting research. They examined some 3,500 skeletons from the area that today is Iran, Iraq, Jordan, Syria, the Middle East, largely speaking, for bone trauma. Specifically, they were looking for bone trauma that could only have occurred through violence as opposed to accidents. And what they found is creating a picture of the evolution of violence in early human urban environments. They've concluded that the development of the earliest cities in Mesopotamia in the Middle East led to a significant increase in violence. And then, some centuries after this peak, the incidence of violence, measured on a per capita basis, begins to decline significantly. All of this is playing out over the period of 4,500 to 2,000 years BCE. What interested me about this was what comes next. The researchers claim that the rate of violence peaked as people came together in concentrated living, in these early cities, but that it reduced significantly once legal systems and a centrally controlled authority evolved. And then they say, parenthetically, oh yes, and trade also increased during this period. As an economist, I look at this and I think, no, you've got it completely backward. As James says often, laws tend not to lead society, but to lag it. That is, society, we as a people, come to some conclusion that we do or do not like a certain thing, and that only then gets reflected in the laws. The laws react to society rather than shape it. And these researchers are claiming here that the decline in violence after cities were established was due in part to the rise of law and authority. And again, as an economist, I would say, no, you've got it backwards. It's your footnote. Trade also increased in these regions during this period. That's the source of the decline in violence and the rise in laws in the legal system and the rule of law comes about, I claim, as a support to this trade. In other words, the story that's going on here is humans come together and initially The easiest way that you can find to become rich, and children figure this out as soon as they're able to stand up and walk, is to take the things that you want from the other people. And if you're stronger than the guy next to you, you can take his stuff and now you're more wealthy. But it's after humans come together, they form society, that they start to realize there's a way they can become even wealthier still. And in the process protect themselves against being predated by still stronger people. And that is to live peaceably, to exchange, to specialize, that I produce the thing that I'm good at and I freely exchange with you and we honor each other in that I'm not going to take your stuff. If you don't want to exchange with me, I'm going to go find somebody else who will exchange with me or I might find some better deal or you might find some better deal somewhere else. And In the long term, although there may be individual instances in which I don't get that thing I want, I gain because not only do I live in an environment in which it's understood that the way to gain things is through peaceful exchange, but the peaceful exchange actually promotes, it causes people to want to produce more. I mean, consider... If you live in an environment where the way to become rich is for other people to take your stuff and for you to take other people's stuff, what is your incentive? Your incentive is not to produce a bunch of stuff, certainly not to have it sitting around because you're just inviting people to come and take it from you. So your tendency will be to just produce the minimal amount you need at the time that you need it, just for yourself. But if you're in an environment where people acknowledge the way to become wealthy is not by taking from others, but by freely exchanging mutual benefit, then all of a sudden everyone has an incentive to be far more productive. I can produce things. I don't have to worry about people taking them from me. In fact, in producing more and more things, I have an even better opportunity, more opportunity to exchange with others, to present the stuff I have to other people who might want it and get their stuff in return. That, I claim, 
is the source of the significant reduction in violence that these researchers saw. And this rise in the rule of law, I claim, is not what was driving the peacefulness and the increase in trade. Rather, it's the other way around, that the more we exchange, the more we decide that we're going to live in this mutually beneficial voluntary society, the more need there is to enumerate what are the rules under which we're operating here. And for those who are skeptical, I point to data, world intentional homicide. So this is the intentional homicide rape murders, basically, per 100,000 people worldwide, has fallen 25% since the mid-1990s. And if you go back further, one century, two centuries, you'll find that the intentional homicide rate, not just in the United States, but worldwide, has fallen by an order of magnitude. Today, it's something like one-tenth or less of what it was one, two centuries ago. And not coincidentally, what's been happening along with that is a massive increase in wealth brought about largely by education, which enables people to specialize their labor, which enables them to produce more and to be better able to exchange voluntarily with the people around them. We give a special shout out to our Patreon sponsors who help us keep the lights on. If you'd like to contribute, go to patreon.com slash words and numbers. For one-stop shopping for all things James and Ant, visit our website wordsandnumbers.org. James, I ran across an article about a week ago about one Lucy Calkins, who I'd never heard of her, but apparently produced a couple of decades ago some new model for teaching reading that was based on recognizing words rather than sounding them out. And this is not my field, so I may not be representing this well. Whole language instead of yes, phonics. Yes, whole language instead of phonics. And the big news here is that her center, which was associated with Columbia University, Columbia University has now washed their hands of her and said, we're not dealing with this anymore. Why? Because apparently it doesn't work. We've had several decades of students not learning how to read and write properly because of this program that she put together. This happened when I was in college. There's an interesting thing. I remember a friend of mine at the time was an education major. I had said something about how stupid whole language was and how by the time it was all said and done, everybody was going to go right back to phonics. And immediately thereafter, homeschooling started taking off and all the homeschool people went straight to phonics because it was how they had learned to read. And people tend to teach things the way they learned those same things. And this girl wrote a paper about me for a class and she let me read it about her stupid friend, James. And I think about that at times like this, when turns out I was right all along. But I say that so often in my life that I was right all along that it's lost all meaning. But it's interesting, right? Because we've got an entire generation or more of people who ended up having a lot of trouble with reading and writing because of how they were taught to read and write. And it goes back, I think, quite nicely uh, as an analog to a time when I was younger and so to you, but maybe not you as much, because I was raised on the new math. I recall adults talking about new math. I didn't understand what they were talking about, but yeah, that's the way I was taught. I was raised on the new math and I didn't understand math half the time. Um, I didn't bother learning anything about math until much later in life after I met you and I kind of had no choice. When you deal with a, an economist, you learn the language of math, at least to some degree. So I became proficient in mathematical things much later in life. But I think I was sold out in a lot of ways by the people who didn't know any better when they were teaching me. They were just doing what they were told. But I think we've got a corollary here. We've got a, a group of people who didn't learn math correctly and a group of people who didn't learn anything about English correctly. Well, what really bothered me about all of this, and I wasn't aware of any of this till I ran across the article, this failed method of teaching has been going on for decades. Yeah. Now, I've, I've got two major problems with this. The first is why would you institute a program like this and keep it in place for decades without first testing it to see whether it's efficacious? Second problem, why are we doing this at all? 
Leave it to the teachers. That's their skill set. They are experts in imparting information to young minds. Let them figure it out. Right. But the brighter lights among us don't want to do that. Right, because if you leave it to teachers, what are you going to get? You're going to get the kind of change that happens incrementally over time, right? They're going to learn how to do this little thing better, and then they're going to communicate that one little thing to their peers, and then those people will communicate it further, and it will take forever to get anything to change. And what's the goal of those who know better, I say as if, they, all those words were capitalized. Those who know better want you to change in their image right now. Right. And their assumption is that their image is the right image. Th this is progressivism in a nutshell, right? Progressivism, the rule by experts. Well, what do we do? We do what the experts tell us. Well, what happens when the experts change their minds? We do something different. And we tend not to hold the experts to task. Well, wouldn't it be better to engage in the incremental search for truth? Right. And you've got, I don't know how many you have, 100,000 teachers in this country. You'd have 100,000 experiments, each one trying stuff. And a lot of them are going to get it wrong. And I think that's the thing that people point to. Well, if we let the teachers do their own thing, there are so many bad teachers out there, they're going to teach poorly and kids won't learn how to read. Okay, there is that chance. Versus the certainty of kids not learning how to read because we impose one model on everybody that doesn't work. Yeah, and, and you and I have been at the tail end of the educational experience, so to speak, as college professors, right, where we find these people in the last four years for most of their education. And what do we find? Uh, I found repeatedly people who couldn't read. Right, yeah, people who, who can't read. And, and I find this, I'm dealing now with, you know, teaching a, a statistics course, and basically it's sophomores and juniors in the class, and the hardest time they have with the statistics isn't doing the statistics. It's reading the English and understanding what's being asked of you. Yeah, come to find out, stats is pretty easy. Yeah, it's just a bunch of rules. You follow the rules, you're done. That, that's right. And it doesn't, people think it requires high-end math. It really doesn't. It barely requires algebra, right? No, but the really hard part is taking something that's in English, translating it into statistics, and then taking the answer and translating it back into English. That's the really hard part. That's right. And it, come to find out, that's almost impossible for a lot of people. So really, the question becomes, why is it that young people have had such a devil of a time learning how to read. I mean, seriously, how could this be so difficult? And then take a look around. What do young people read? And here I think we find another batch of problems because they do in fact read, but they read things in sound bite length. Yeah. Right? So they read a lot during an average day, but they never read more than, say, a paragraph or two at a time. When's the last time you saw a gaggle of young people sitting around reading books? Doesn't happen anymore. And I understand why. So, you know, keep your hate mail. I don't need to hear a lot of reasons why in the information age that people aren't reading books. I get it. The larger point here is that something has been lost. And when something is lost, you can generally watch ability going down the toilet right behind it. I think you've underlined something important that I was thinking about the other day as I sat there in between classes watching all of these students on their iPhones, and they are all reading, and they have the sense that they're well-read, but as you say, they're looking at one paragraph on a hundred different articles rather than 100 paragraphs on an article. And what you get then is this sense that you have become educated, that you've learned something because you've your mind has touched a whole bunch of topics, but it's only touched them on the very surface. And so consequently, when I had this problem today, three students wrote me and said they don't understand the question. This was a statistics question, and it was along the lines of what fraction of stocks yield a positive return? That's easy. Well, they were having trouble with positive return. What does this mean? you got to be kidding me. This is the thing. Words, as you have said often, have meaning. And if you're not going to take the meaning seriously, if you're just going to treat them as noises that convey a feeling, you're not going to understand what's being said. And <laughs> Noises that convey a feeling, like ouch or... Right, mm, yes. <laughs> things like this. <laughs> and you've, you said this on our last episode, and I've experienced it as well, of people taking issue with things that we have written because they didn't read what we wrote. 
I mean, their eyes passed over the words, but they didn't internalize what we were saying. That requires a, a deep level of reading that even goes beyond any of this topic we're talking about, whether you sound out the thing or whether you recognize the word. You've got to think clearly about this word that's in front of you. Yeah, and look, I knew that something was wrong from the day I graded my first stack of papers as a young professor. It took like three or four papers that first stack in to say, oh boy, something ain't right here. And it never really did get much better. Yeah. You know, we've we've got, I think, in a lot of ways, a lost generation, maybe more, when it comes to the written word and the ability to to really parse things out well and meaningfully. And I'm not saying that nobody can. I'm just saying that not nearly a big enough percentage can, that I would have expected better by the numbers than what we ended up getting. Surely the majority of the people can't make nuanced graduate level arguments, right? Why would they? Of course, that's not what to expect. But so few people can that you wonder where we've gone wrong. And, you know, look, you, you look at the output, the scholarly output of the world lately and how bad it is. And and I, I think this is all related. And I wonder what's good. I hate to sound like an old person, but I wonder what happens 20, 30 years down the road. Um, do we end up in a... Well, as at least, Aunt, as an old person, you'll be dead by then, so you don't have to worry about it. Do we end up in a place where you know, physical objects, the, the bridges, the roads are deteriorating because the people who are building them don't understand well what they're doing because they don't take reading seriously. And, and if you think that's extreme, I point to a very good example. It's not a physical example, but our legal system. Our legal system, starting with the Constitution, has just fallen apart over the past century, in large part, I claim, because people don't take seriously what they're reading. They treat it as noises conveying emotion. I think that's somehow unfair. They're taught from an early age that it's an adversarial system, and it's their job to win. Now go win. Well, of course they bruise the language. Of course they do. The more interesting question is architecture. Do you trust the buildings you walk into? Yeah. I lived in Iraq. Did I, I, didn't, I didn't trust the buildings I lived in in Iraq. I am happy to tell you this. Why not? Because I wasn't convinced that the architects knew what they were doing. I wasn't convinced they knew what loads the walls had to bear, that maybe this thing comes tumbling down. And I hate to make Ayn Rand's argument for her because I'm not a big fan. But, you know, she makes the argument that planes will fall from the sky and things like this. And, yeah, all right, maybe maybe I get it. I don't think you're going to see that, but I wouldn't at all be surprised if you saw an uptick. You know, where before we had X percent of bad things happening, now we have X plus K percent. The larger issue here, if you settle back in your chair for a minute, is this need that we seem to have for novelty. Were people not learning how to read? Was there some problem with reading of which I was wholly and blissfully unaware that a brand new approach that rewrote the entire process of learning how to read was somehow going to upend? Where was the massive illiteracy? And, you know, it's, it's not like we can't measure that. Someone somewhere had to get a graduate degree in education and said, well, I know what I'll do. I'll come up with some new way of teaching reading. And lo and behold, the thing snowballed. And before you know it, it became a policy somewhere. Yeah, um, it makes me want to go home and think of a new and exciting way to teach something that I know about. But of course, there's nothing new under the sun, right? And you, you and I are, are honest enough at least to admit that. There's nothing I could make up that would be any better it by way of pedagogy that than what already exists. And this comes back to my argument for privatized education. And I don't necessarily mean that we can't have public schools, but you need to, for schools to be successful, we need massive decentralization. Whether they're funded by taxpayer dollars or private tuition, you need to have the principals deciding who works there and for how long. You need to have the teachers deciding what they teach. And ideally, you need to have the parents deciding which school to send their kids to. You need choice across the board if you want solutions to these problems. Really, what you're appealing to is a form of something else that we talk about a lot, and that's spontaneous order. You set these things in motion, and they take on a life of their own as human beings participate in interacting with other human beings. And before you know it, nobody could have planned anything that ends up happening. 
Now you can react to what has happened. So if you see that somebody across town has done considerably better than you have, you can alter your trajectory. But to gather everybody in a building and say, okay, from here on out, this is how we're going to do it. And expecting good results from that are the literal definition of lunacy. Yep. Because you can't plan human things all that well. The best you can do is take part in human things and see what happens. I would say there, there may well be places that do need planning. But what you need to do is first leave the system alone and see where it's failing and apply the planning there. Don't start off with, okay, here's what we're all going to do. Because generally speaking, the people who are making those decisions aren't necessarily any better versed at finding answers than the people who are in the classroom. Well, I never did understand what the problem was that whole language was replacing. Yes, right. It's not like people weren't learning to read. They were. They learned less well with whole language. So now, okay, we're doing away with that. And what was the, I ran across this statistic recently and I was astounded. The literacy rate during the Civil War in the U.S., do you recall what this was? I do not. I would have thought, you know, mid-1800s, I would have thought, well, 50%, 40%. It was something like north of 80%, 85%. You had common soldiers riding home, writing home. I would imagine that's probably the first war in which that ever happened. Oh, no, there were letters from, from wars all the way back. From the common soldier? Uh, well, a large majority, I don't know. But yeah, I, I can't speak uh, apart from the American experience. So I don't know if Roman soldiers were writing back to mom and dad, mater and pater, I guess it would be. <laughs> um, but but I do know that, you know, in, in the Revolutionary War, you're going to find some correspondence and, you know, things like this. But to your point, this apparently wasn't a problem. What were they trying to fix? I don't know. But it's very clear that they did break something. Well, uh, and, and that's just so often the case, right? And and you start to think about, well, all right, if that happened and if there was this thing, new math, were there other things that got screwed up along the way? Well, I mean, what else have we bungled? Right. And now I'm not so sure that that list is a short one. We, we may have everything that we try to transmit be on that list. You think of things, the rewriting of history that we get, Hannah Nicole Jones with this idiotic 1619 project, right? And you can point out till you're blue in the face all of the historical errors that she has committed. These are willful errors, right? These aren't honest mistakes that a decent academic makes. No, no, no. These are willful errors designed to mislead. You can look at Nancy McLean and all of the miserable, terrible things that she does in the name of transmitting knowledge to another generation. Incidentally, our friend Phil Magnus, pivotal in debunking both of those things. Anyone who's interested, look back through our episodes. We had him on maybe a year ago talking about the 1619 Project. He's done more good for humanity debunking these things than most people have done with anything. But, I mean, how did we get here where, where people can just look at something and say, oh, I know, I can twist this around to make it seem like this, and I can get rich, and therefore it's a good thing. This is what education has become, right? I don't think it was always like this. I think, look, new math was probably an attempt to teach math better that failed. Whole language was probably an attempt to teach reading better that failed. Well, I can't help but think that both of those things came about after we established a Department of Education. There's always that, isn't there? But, you know, you look around and you never see any shortage of villains. And you wonder why it is that people have to go find some new and exciting way to understand something that is neither new nor exciting. And I think that just speaks to the human condition, right? People are programmed to be this way. And I think we're always going to be undoing the damage that people like this do, which is why you don't find uh, dispositionally conservative people who are famous for novel approaches to things. Of course you don't. Why on earth would you? And that's all the time we've got this week on Words and Numbers. Until next time, be sure to follow us on Twitter. Handles are in the show notes. Join Words and Numbers Backstage, the Facebook group where the conversation continues, and send us email, wordsandnumberspodcast at gmail.com. Until next week, try to be nice to one person. One person who doesn't deserve it. Just one. And who knows? It may turn into a trend. Give it a shot. You might feel good about yourself. You could say you tried. You tried. That's right. Till next week. Can't take it easy. See you next week, James. Yeah.